We're now gonna turn our attention to an analysis of some of the key methods in the Java condition object class. And you'll see that the bulk of these methods are inherited from the condition interface. In particular, it's got three primary methods that are the most important ones to focus on. And these methods allow threads to wait and notify each other. And those methods are await, signal, and signal all. Now, the, the method names here are similar to the method names in Java's built-in monitor object interface, in particular, Java's built-in monitor objects, which come from inheriting from the object class, which is the root of all classes in, in Java reference types. The me methods that come out of that are wait, notify, and notify all. And the ones that are part of the condition object are await, signal, and signal all. And the reason why they had to come up with different names is that the methods that are defined in Java object, in other words, wait, notify, and notify all, are defined as final and therefore cannot be overridden by subclasses. So they couldn't reuse those names in the implementation of the condition object. As is often been the case in the synchronizers we've looked up, we've looked at up to this point, the method implementations actually come largely from the abstract queued synchronizer framework. And that is kind of the heavy, the heavy lifter for an awful lot of the stuff here. The await method will suspend the calling thread until it's signaled by some other thread that calls signal or signal all, or it can also be interrupted. When the thread is, when await is called, the underlying implementation will park the calling thread on the condition objects queue, which is what is used to implement its wait set, which is the set of waiting threads. If the associated lock is not held when a wait is called, then you'll get an illegal monitor state exception, which is a bad, bad thing. So make sure you always acquire the lock before you call a wait. And the easiest way to do that is just to follow the, the idiomatic use of the try finally block, as we often talk about, where you acquire the lock, then go into the try block, check the condition in a loop with the lock held, and then call await if you can't make forward progress because the, the guard uh, forced you to suspend yourself. Remember the guarded suspension pattern. Signal moves the longest waiting thread from the queue of a given condition object to the queue for the owning lock. So it doesn't start things up right away. It simply moves the thread from the wait set on the queue for the condition object, the one that's been waiting the longest, and it moves it to the queue for the owning lock. And conversely, or in contrast, signal all moves all the threads from the condition object's queue to the owning lock's queue. And so as a consequence, you can end up with something called the thundering herd problem. And the thundering herd problem is a problem in uh, concurrency and synchronization where you wake a whole pile of threads up only to have most of them or almost all of them go right back to sleep because they couldn't make forward progress. If you go back to our analogy of the, the pizza delivery uh, metaphor that I used when we first started talking about condition objects, it's kind of like having a bunch of uh, pizza delivery people sleeping in the waiting room waiting for a pizza and the keys to show up. And when one pizza shows up or one key shows up, everybody wakes up and they all go clamoring to try to get the pizza and the keys. There's really only a need to wake one of those sleeping pizza delivery people up because you're only gonna be able to make one delivery with a pizza and a key. So be very careful and avoid using signal all if you can possibly do so. There are some cases where it really pays off and it's useful, but most of the time you can get by with just using signal and some other tricks we'll talk about in just a bit. Of course, there are other methods in the Java condition object interface. So uh, there's a number of variants of await. You can see some of them listed here. So we've talked about the one that is the default one. The other ones that they have allow interruptible, uh, well, sorry. So by default, you have uh, interruptible awaits. You can also have uninterruptible awaits where you cannot be interrupted. There's also a bunch of timed operations. And as you can see here, those timed operations take essentially either milliseconds, microseconds, or seconds as the time unit. There's also a nanosecond await. And then there's finally another await that uses a date. 
So you can use that to schedule something like a calendar uh, operation to wake you up at some point in the future based on day of the week and, and the year and so on. Unlike Java's built-in monitor objects, which also have a timed wait call, the timed await calls give sensible return values. One of the other huge deficiencies with the built-in Java monitor object methods is its await call that's timed doesn't indicate whether or not the timeout occurs, which is absolutely bizarre. And uh, if you take a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, it'll give you some hints on how to work around this glaring deficiency with Java built-in monitor objects. But by far the best way to overcome this glaring deficiency is just not to use Java built-in monitor objects and instead use the Java condition objects that we're talking about here. So that's the end of the overview of the key methods in the Java condition object class. And we'll come back and, and talk about other dimensions here in just a moment.